Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. Uh, my colleagues Amjad Atala and Daniel Levy, commissioned at the, who co-direct the Middle East Task Force here, commissioned this interesting study, which I think has many complex uh, uh, lessons, nuances, and it's worth spending some time uh, studying this and discussing it. But one avenue of the discussion that we wanted to have over the next hour, those of you who feel like you're in the back and want to come up front, it's always better to see people in the front, so feel free to join us, is to talk about the American appetite, the American dimensions of this, given the poll results that we've seen. What does the American climate look like negatively, positively for an agenda? I think when I called uh, my friend Jim Pinkerton, I'll talk about it in a moment, he says, you mean looking towards 2010 elections, 2012 elections? I said, absolutely right. But let me tell you who we have here. First, Stephen Cohen, who's been so involved as an early architect working with presidents and prime ministers and foreign ministers on both the U.S. and the Israeli, um, but also the um, um, Arab Middle East side with, with the peace process and negotiations for decades. Uh, he's a real iconic figure uh, in this. He is the author of Beyond America's Grasp, A Century of Failed Diplomacy in the Middle East, founder and president of the Institute for Middle East Peace and Development. To his right, we have Jim Pinkerton, who is a senior research fellow at the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation in my group. Um, it's, I call Jim the 900-pound brain, uh, who served both in the uh, George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush, and uh, that initial m matters a lot, I think, <laughs> the George H. W. Bush uh, administration and Reagan administration. Um, Jim is a contributor at Fox News Channel. Uh, interestingly, he was a senior advisor to uh, Mike Huckabee. You cannot ask questions about Mike Huckabee today, but he was a senior advisor uh, to the Huckabee for President campaign um, and an outstanding sort of political conceptualizer and big thinker uh, writ large. Heather Hurlbert is executive director of the National Security Network, um, used to be serve as deputy director of the Washington Office of the International Crisis Group. She was, uh, ran her own, I'm going to mention this, because she ran her own communications and strategy practice for a number of years during the George W. Bush period, um, of which I was a great recipient frequently of her advice and counsel, um, but was also served in the Clinton administration as special assistant to President Clinton and speechwriter uh, there. So uh, she also worked with the State Department's policy planning staff, worked with this, as a speechwriter for Secretaries of State Albright and Warren Christopher. So we have a very interesting group here who've been th sort of thinking about you know, the American sandbox, if you will, uh, with some dimension. So let me start with Steve Cohen. He'll speak for about eight to ten minutes, and then we will work through, and then I'll open up to the floor. So please welcome Steve Cohen. Good, Good morning, everybody. Uh, the book took me two and a half years to write, so to do what I'm doing in eight minutes is going to be a challenge, but let me, let me begin by reflecting on the implications that were drawn by the panelists on the survey. Basically, people said the following, that there should be a major effort of public re-outreach from the Obama administration to Israel, and there was a clear statement that Netanyahu has a great deal of support in Israel for his defense of Israeli security. Now, if you take those two points, do we think that we have here any formula that would get beyond the stalemate in the Israeli-Palestinian issue that we presently have? If there is a big outreach to the Israeli people, will that produce the breakthrough that we have not had from the emphasis that the President has put on settlement freeze? I think the answer to that cannot be yes, because the problem now has to do with a decision that has to be made by the Prime Minister of Israel. And if we take these survey results seriously, he already has a great deal of support from the Israeli people. And that great deal of support so far has not provided him with the context in which he feels ready to make a major decision to move forward on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. 
The second thing we saw is that the division in the Palestinian camp between Fatah and Hamas creates the context in which Israelis believe that withdrawing from the West Bank is a very major problem because it would produce the insecurity if Hamas became the leadership of the Palestinians. On this second point, it is very clear that that is a point in which the attitude of the Israeli people and the attitude of the Israeli Prime Minister are very much linked. He also, in his semi-support of the possibility at some point of a Palestinian state, and we can only say semi, um, the main concern that he was expressing was that it would not be possible to do something unless there was a solution to the Israeli security problems that would come in the West Bank. The main security problems that would come from the West Bank relate to the fact that Israelis are not convinced that if the present leadership continues, it will be able to continue to dominate Palestinian politics and will not be overrun in the same way they were overrun in Gaza. I'm not suggesting that this is a realistic assessment of the situation in the West Bank compared to the relationship, the situation in Gaza, but it is a strong Israeli concern. And the Israeli concern is that once there is withdrawal from the West Bank, there is a very strong likelihood that missiles will come into the West Bank and rather than be sent to settlements in the Israeli south, in the Negev, they will become a target, they will be able to target the centers of Israeli population in the center of the country in Tel Aviv, north and south of Tel Aviv, and this would be an impossible situation for Israel, and most of all, that they would be able to reach the airport, the the, uh, the Ben-Gurion airport, which is the dominant airport for Israel, and as we know, that is the airport that is critical to the whole of the Israeli economy, because it is through that airport that Israel exports to Europe and elsewhere, and that export is a critical part of the Israeli economy. So the feeling is that anything that would create the circumstance in which Hamas or its successors would have the opportunity to bring missiles into the West Bank is a totally intolerable place for Israel to be. And for this reason, when Israel talks about a Palestinian state, it does not talk about an independent sovereign state. It's talking about some version of an autonomy situation, which is not acceptable to any Palestinian. I have only two minutes. Wow. The point I want to make is that we need to think beyond those points if we want to move out of the present situation. We have to think about what is it that could push or encourage Prime Minister Netanyahu to believe that establishing a Palestinian state is not a major danger to the Israeli security situation. It seems to me there are two directions at least towards which we have to think. One of them has to do with the establishment of an international peace force that would prevent the possibility of missiles entering the West Bank. And this, in order to be uh, convincing to Israelis, would have to be a peace force of NATO in which, for the first time, American participation would be part of the story. Israel has never wanted to have uh, American boots on 
Israeli soil as a protection of Israel. This is a ma was a major issue from the days of Harry Truman. And it would be a very difficult issue for today, but it seems to me that if we want to think about a security against this possibility, not that I believe that Hamas is going to take over from Fatah or the, take over the government of the West Bank, but Israel cannot uh, deal with that as a, even a low probability. And so if there's to be a security arrangement, maybe there has to be a consideration of a NATO force which includes American troops. The second thing is that we need to think about why it was that President Dwight Eisenhower, after the Suez Crisis, was able to give an ultimatum to David Ben-Gurion to withdraw from the Sinai. And not only that he was able to give that ultimatum, but what is most interesting is that Ben-Gurion responded to that ultimatum almost immediately. And Israel withdrew from the Sinai in a very short period of time. What was the difference in the relationship between the United States and Israel at that time and the relationship between the United States and Israel at this time? Well, there are a number of answers to that question. But key, one of the key answers is that right after the 1957 withdrawal from the Sinai, Israel embarked. Ben-Gurion gave the instructions to Shimon Peres to try to find a way for Israel to develop a nuclear capability. And Peres went off to Paris and to France, where he had negotiated the pr French participation in the tripartite invasion of Egypt of 1956. And now he negotiated with the French to give Israel the help to start trying to develop its own nuclear capability. And that was a big step in removing the vulnerability that Ben-Gurion felt when he had to accept that ultimatum so quickly. And it is not the case today because the situation is that Israel is the sole nuclear plow power in the Middle East at the moment. But it also suggests something about a direction for thinking for the strategy for the Obama administration. The Obama administration has embarked on a serious attempt to reach an agreement with Iran in which Iran would not seek nuclear weapons. And if we think that that negotiation is not a fake, if it will actually go somewhere, and the Iranians will at some point consider a real response to the American concern about the nuclear developments, can we believe that at some point the Iranians will not raise the question of Israel's nuclear capability. It is probably, I think it is more or less inconceivable that they will not make that an important issue if they ever consider giving up the nuclear capability of their own. The United States has played an important role in protecting Israel's so-called nuclear ambiguity. It has made sure that Israel has not been subject of great uh, pressure from the international community when it deals with the non-proliferation treaty and it deals with the applications. Okay, I do not have any more time. So I just want to say that there are other things besides the idea of appealing to the Israeli public, which is an interesting idea and a good idea in itself, but which will not, I think, bring about the change in the Israeli-Palestinian situation. And we need to think more broadly of ways in which the administration would be able to move the process forward. And that requires some historical context of the situations under which Israel responds to the United States and the situations in which Israel feels that it does not have to so respond.
Thanks very much, Stephen. And I assure you we'll be back uh, for fuller discussion uh, during this hour, which needs to end promptly at noon. So I'm sensitive to the, to the need to discuss. Jim Pinkerton, uh, you're at bat. Thank you. And, and don't worry, Steve. Heather and I get the message. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I follow mostly domestic politics. And uh, so, these, so when I saw the 4% headline, I said, OK, well, that's just that. Uh, so the, the, this survey finding uh, makes an enormous contribution just to uh, as they say in D.C., no, any charge that gets made has to get responded to. Uh, um, having said that, if, if this 40 percent number were to be on the front page of the papers tomorrow and lead on all the news tonight, uh, which it won't, but if it were, I don't think it would make a lot of difference, frankly. I think uh, uh, American public opinion is, is where it is and Capitol Hill is where it is and it's, and it's not likely to change. I think that uh, uh, the American public is simultaneously uh, pro-Israel and, in, as the Pew Center uh, findings a couple of days ago showed, uh, increasingly isolationist. So there's sort of a sense that we're going to be for Israel and not too interested in most other ventures. I think the sort of optimism of the George <coughs> W. Bush uh, era about uh, transforming the world has faded along with people's uh, uh, savings accounts in the, in the last few years. So. I don't think there's uh, much appetite, as, as President Obama has discovered in the last nine months. There's not a lot of enthusiasm and a great deal of, 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 of pushback on, on, on all this. And uh, I think that, you know, the, as somebody is telling the president right now, you know, look, the, your reelection campaign is a mere three years away now, so don't, this is not the time to take big ventures. And if the 2010 uh, midterm elections go, as most people think they will, uh, there'll they'll probably be even less uh, support there. Um, having said that, uh, obviously the, other world, the rest of the world uh, gets a vote in, in all these proceedings as well. I think what the European Union is doing is, is consequential. Um, and I think the Israelis uh, uh, see it that way too. I was noticing that uh, Dov Weissglass, who was a former aide to Ariel Sharon, uh, which is to say he's no, no Dove, uh, was wrote an op-ed in, in Udiot uh, on December 7th in, in which he said, this is a quote, what Sharon understood and Olmert after him is now becoming apparent to the current government. Good or bad, just or unjust, that is the reality. Still, this is still quoting now, no one in the world agrees to Israel's presence in a majority of the Judea and Samaria territories and the continued construction there. Israeli persistence will bring upon it diplomatic isolation, and this is something that Israel cannot afford. The freeze plan is an attempt to avoid this. It is not important in and of itself, but as a first sign of a process of understanding and sobriety, it is highly meaningful. Um, and I think that is, you know, I think that, that, you know, look, the last time Netanyahu was prime minister, he looked into the abyss and said, we better do something, and they gave back most of Hebron. Uh, uh, I think you'll see something like that. Now, that's, that's just a, a, a guess. Um, and I think American public opinion, as I said, which is pro-Israel but also skeptical of foreign inter interventions and foreign ventures in general, uh, will be supportive in a kind of, you know, a, a friendly but detached way as people are more preoccupied with domestic issues. Although I must say, just from a domestic political point of view, um, any talk about NATO troops or U.S. troops in the West Bank would open up a whole new can of worms that... Uh, you know, any president would say, well, I'd rather do that in my second term. Uh, <laughs> okay, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, and now we have at bat Heather Hurlberg. Heather? Well, I'm going to use my uh, exactly eight minutes to, to try to do briefly for our understanding of U.S. public opinion a little bit of what the previous panel tried to do for our understanding of Israeli public opinion, which is to say, to make it a little more um, complex than, and rich than maybe it often is, because I think we have, we have a very strong um, conventional wisdom about what American public opinion is on Israel and the peace process and how that sets limits for what any administration can do. And I want to um, suggest that the reality is a little more complicated than that, and then open a conversation about what that will or won't mean over uh, the next year, and also looking, um, as Jim mentioned, into 2012. 
So uh, the first point is just to push back a little bit on, Jim, your comment that the American public is where it is. So one of the interesting things is that, yes, the American public is where it is, but that is not the place that we tend to think it is. So, um, for example, if you start with American Jews, well, how many of American Jews say that they vote on Middle East Israel issues? Um, only 8% which is a rather small number. And uh, the other interesting thing is that if we look at the crosstabs, that 8% already has a pretty firm, um, very conservative view, and frankly, they're voting on those issues and they're not gonna change how they vote. They've already made up their minds. So uh, there's that. Um, Jim Gerstein, in the past, when he has worked on uh, domestic opinion on this, likes to say that if one should think of um, the American Jewish community's attitude toward voting on these issues as that, that it's a threshold question rather than a voting question, which is to say that a candidate has to um, convince the public with a certain level of certainty that, that he or she really does um, feel the unique U.S. bond with Israel. Um, I mean, Jim put it to me a little more pungently than, than that, but, um, but that you have to cross a threshold of convincing both the public in general and the American Jewish, Jewish community in particular, that you're serious about Israel's security, that you really get it. And then um, American Jews, like other Americans, vote primarily on domestic issues. So it's quite possible to overstate the degree to which what a president does or doesn't do on, on Israel um, hurts or helps his or her chances for, for re-election. And this is also, by and large, true for Congress with a couple of, um, of dramatic exceptions in a couple of states that, that we all know. So I don't want to overstate that for Congress, but I think we habitually overstate just how much of a problem uh, this is domestically. Um, at the same time, we also there's no question if you look at American public opinion, in some ways it's, it's parallel to Israeli public opinion in that the public has not followed the strategic calculations which have led this administration to see a real urgency around moving forward on the Middle East peace process. So the public, again, both the general public and um, American Jews, by and large, yes, it would be a good idea to move forward on peace. They're very supportive of the U.S. taking the lead, which is interesting because it's a little different from a lot of pl other places in the world where, as Jim said, the public, and then actually this is pretty constant over time, is just as happy to see us doing things in concert with other people, doesn't want to hear about the U.S. always taking the lead anywhere. But it has been sufficiently sort of well absorbed over the generations that Israel is different and there's, there's a quite consistent majority that wants to see the U.S. taking the lead and is comfortable, by the way, with the U.S. taking the lead, even if that means pressuring the sides a little bit, even if it means asking the sides to do things that are hard for them. Um, so, but having said all of that, the, if you ask sort of top, top three or four foreign policy issues, you know, last year it was Iraq, this year it's Afghanistan, there's a very strong awareness of Iran, less strong awareness of this issue, again, less of a sense of urgency than this um, administration has. Um, and then I think the last disconnect that, that we have to take into account, and this, this leads back to the, real, to the real political question here, is that this administration has, has really bet all of its cards, and you'll see that very clearly if you look at the Nobel, the President's Nobel speech from earlier today. This administration has bet with everything in the kitty that Americans will, will take to, will accept, and will reward a president who promotes a strategy that sees, um, sees itself as strength through engagement. Um, the president uh, got off a wonderful sarcastic line in the, in the Nobel speech this morning that um, he said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, um, I know that engaging with dictatorial powers lacks the warm satisfaction of ideological purity. That, that's almost but not quite word for word. Um, and you know it's a great it's a great fun line. It made me laugh, but that is that is still something of an open debate and a pretty a pretty vicious debate in the in the American political context. And so while on the one hand, um, Americans aren't aren't voting on these issues, and very very few Americans will consciously tell you that they are making their voting decisions because politician X or Y or Z likes to talk to di dictators and terrorists or just plain old bad guys. Um, a tremendous amount of our political debate and the subtext of how candidates are covered is informed by this question of strength and how strength is perceived and measured and how the media 
and um, talking heads like Jim Pinkerton and me um, perceive strength and how it's how it's expressed. So the way that the Israel issue will seep very strongly into our retail politics over the next uh, one and three years and probably even beyond that is through this question of can a president, um, can a political leadership, uh, can a, ideally, frankly, a bipartisan political leadership keep expressing to the American people that um, steps to move forward on the um, peace process are strong and are going to be effective for Americans, um, even if they don't look like this kind of classical narrative of, of strength through strength, which is how, when we talk about foreign policy in the mass media, we, we tend to talk about it. Um, so in that sense, that's a way, I mean, this is a little different, I think, from what Stephen Cohen was thinking about. That's a way in which this, this poll that New America has commissioned and its seemingly counterintuitive results can actually be, be quite useful. Um, not necessarily in the obvious way of kind of trying to hammer on people, say, see, the Israelis don't hate Barack Obama. Because we don't fight out these issues in the realm of fact in um, American or any public opinion for that matter. Um, there's a wonderful adage which Steve has heard me say so many times his head will probably hit the table, but um, we, we form, we all form frames to think about issues and if we're confronted with a fact that doesn't match how we framed the issue, we don't reject the frame, we reject the fact. And this, this survey is the classic example of, of marshalling some facts that are wonderful facts but that will very easily be rejected, frankly, by um, the classic sort of, even in a smart, informed lay person who is trying to follow this issue in between following the health care bill and microwaving breakfast and, you know, you hit the blender and you miss half of the, half of the story. So if we think about it that way and, and we say to ourselves, okay, how can we use these facts to change the way we talk about strength and engagement and how that plays out for Americans in the Middle East peace process, that's going to be the way that, that we can make effective change. And I see Steve fidgeting over here. Oh. <laughs> but nonetheless, I think it's probably time to wrap up and open up for questions and debate. Thank you, Heather. I'm sorry to be so uh, draconian, uh, but that's what I'm known for. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to put just a couple of other uh, currents on the table and then, and then open up to, to everyone uh, for questions, discussion, comment. Um, we've got a good, good 30 minutes before our next transition when Daniel Levy um, will take over. It's a couple things. You know, I, I, what we're supposed to be talking about here is sort of the American appetite, the American interest in moving this forward. And, and I think it's a very muddy, mixed uh, picture. Uh, recently, I was at the International Crisis Group dinner in New York when Bill Clinton was honored. And all these young women and young guys wanted to have their picture taken with Clinton. I wanted to say hello too, and I knew I didn't compete very well. Um, so I said, what could I put, put out there to him from a distance over the table? To, and I said, you know, what about Israel, Palestine, Middle East stuff? And he literally came over, grabbed my arm. You could see the glee in his eye. He said, there's so much more we should be doing. You could tell that if he was in the White House, he, like Barack Obama, would have made this a defining challenge. But he embraced the notion, and, and he understood that the echo effect that came from engagement in this issue was so much more than the population of Palestinian Israelis, that the, that the echo effect you get on many other global issues is, is, is profound. So you could, there, there was one measure of, of enthusiasm. Uh, recently I spoke to a senior White House official, uh, um, without describing who it was, but, but significant, and, and I asked this individual you know, I've been hearing rumors from Arab leaders that, that the White House was losing enthusiasm for the Israeli-Palestinian process, um, that we were going to be moving back. Was this true? And he says, no, it's not true. It is not off the table. President Obama has not lost enthusiasm for this venture. But let me not under I, I don't think I can underscore enough how disappointed he is and dismayed by behavior on all sides in the, in the engagement. Uh, uh, on the issue, and that, and that, another comment that I thought was, and he said, you know, that relations between Israel and the United States are probably icier now behind the scenes than they have been in, in modern memory uh, between a president and a prime minister, which was interesting, and that the comment was that Israel was confusing its tactical interests and short-term interests with longer-term strategic goals and interests, um, which which the White House found dismaying. Well, that, so that is interesting, showing I think ambivalence. 
Jim Jones at the J Street Con Conference said if there was one issue that he could solve, that he could apply resources to, it would be this one. Zbig Brzezinski, in an issue, uh, in an article that's about to come out in Foreign Affairs magazine, it's not out yet, um, references Barack Obama's Nobel Peace Prize speech with parentheses around it saying it has not been given yet. I got it a few days ago, but now, of course, it has been given, where Brzezinski encourages the president to use the speech as a reaffirmation and doubling down, essentially, on the importance of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, cause and issue. Let me read to you what the president said in his Nobel uh, speech this morning, or this afternoon, depending which time zone you're in. Um, he said, you know, in, 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 it, the, it, and yet somehow, given the diz di dizzying pace of globalization, the cultural lev leveling of modernity, it perhaps comes as no surprise that people fear the loss of what they cherish in their particular identities, their race, their tribe, and perhaps most powerfully, their religion, in the one dot, dot, dot. And he says, we see it in the Middle East as the conflict between Arabs and Jews seems to harden. We see it in the nations that are torn asunder uh, by tribal lines, suggesting that you see things moving backwards. That is all he said in this speech. So he did, obviously didn't listen to his big Brzezinski. And despite other comments about uh, the way in which he doubled down on health care, the way in which he doubled down on climate change, he seems not, at least not visibly, to be doubling down uh, on the Middle East uh, peace process, at least from this speech. And so my question to the panel real quickly is, I, I pay, I'm a Politburo, old Politburo watcher, and as I watch the White House in the same terms, and you do see mixed, mixed signals and mixed messages come in, do you think it's an exercise in futility at this point or not to try to make what Obama defined as a defining challenge for his administration and to walk away from it? Is there a cost Jim, I mean, I agree with you on the elections partly, but I also know that, the, 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 that when Richard Nixon came in, 69 and 70, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for breaking open relations with China, communist China, red China. And, and as they looked at that election, it could have been devastating uh, to them, but the pre-positioning that Nixon did was quite bold and interesting given America's portfolio. Should there be, is there a net positive that comes from the shock of you know, Nixon goes to China's success of seeming like you can change the gravity of, of historical inertia? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, um, if, if I thought that the Obama people had demonstrated the kind of historical, geopolitical shrewdness that Henry Kissinger did, then I, I, I might be optimistic that somewhere between now and 2012 they're going to uncork some huge new initiative. I mean, if, if, you, if you all remember, uh, President Nixon went to China in, I think, February of 72, so it was sort of, and then he went to Russia, the Soviet Union, in, I think, May of 72, so he had two huge diplomatic coups to put into his, you know, to prove to people that he was solving Vietnam and everything else in a, in a smart way. Um, it just seems to me that everything I've seen so far, they just sort of miscalculated what they could get through with Netanyahu, what they could get done on Capitol Hill. And for reasons I've, I've said before, American public opinion just sort of doesn't really reward them. The people who do reward you for glorious Middle East, Middle East peace activism are NGOs and think tanks and foundations. And so it's interesting that Bill Clinton, who I don't think did a whole lot on Middle East peace in his first term, then did more in his <clears throat> second term, and is even more active now that he's not president anymore. I mean, he and Jimmy Carter and most of the rest of them spend a lot more time talking about the importance of Middle East peace after they're done with the voters uh, than before. So I, I disagree with one crucial piece of that, which is the other group of folks that reward you for big breakthroughs on these issues are the media, the chattering classes, um, frankly, all of us here. And so there's a way that even though the general public doesn't directly reward you for it, reward you, for it you reap huge benefits in how you're presented to the public. And Steve, there's no question that a big breakthrough on this would, would be enormous for them in how they're presented and how, you know, if you think about the election results last year, the public knows that it voted for something different than what it was getting from George W. Bush in the international arena. But folks are not really clear on exactly what that was or what they were going to get. And in the best of all possible worlds, a big success on Middle East peace or one of several other areas, but Middle East peace is probably the best one, as General Jones said, 
would really sort of make it very clarifying for people what it is that Obama stands for internationally, how that pays off for, for things that, that people have a vague emotional attachment to. And so it would produce a huge kind of atmospheric dividend that does translate down into how sort of local media coverage happens that, that uh, determines votes and so on. Now, having said that, the costs of a big failure are also pretty enormous. And that's where I think if you've got a White House that's juggling things that it has no choice on, you know, sort of they can't put Afghanistan on the back burner. Um, they've tried mightily to put Iran on the back burner, or not on the back burner, but to take it off the front burner, and we'll see, we'll see how that plays out. So I think, you know, there's, there's an inevitable kind of the, the urgent pushes out the important. And, you know, the, the problem with the Nixon to China analogy, well, there's a couple problems with Nixon to China, the, the first one being, of course... Maybe more than a couple. Well, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but one of them is, of course, the Chinese also perceived that as a moment that it was very much in their interests. And so the key problem, it seems to me, the administration faces really... It, the um, American political scene is actually not their primary problem. It would be great if the American political scene were their worst problem when it came to peace in the Middle East, but convincing the parties that it would be the, in their interest to move forward now is a much bigger challenge than convincing the American public to fill in behind. And as Stephen Cohen answers, I want to ask, you know, Stephen laid out a framework which I found very interesting as saying that the function of American possibilities really rests in what the Prime Minister of Israel accepts or doesn't accept. So influencing that. And it made me think of this question George Stephanopoulos asked Barack Obama. Has any foreign leader run circles around you or beaten you up? Uh, uh, or, you know, like, like Khrushchev did to Kennedy. And I had written about this previously, and Barack Obama said, no, I don't think anybody's really gotten the best of me. But it is your, I wrote to George right away, and I said, did you watch the Netanyahu? <laughs> uh, so, and is Netanyahu, to some degree, in this equation, the definer of Obama's limits and weaknesses, much like Khrushchev was with Kennedy? And, and, and whereas Khrushchev was an enemy, to some degree, at that point, we've had an ally define the limits of of power of our president? I think that's partly true. And I think it has to do with the linkage between what Obama has started with Iran and what he has started with the Israelis and Palestinians. I think that there is a very important linkage here because uh, for Netanyahu, the issue of Iran not developing nuclear capability is of primary importance. And insofar as Obama begins to show a success there, he has a possibility of having an effect on Netanyahu by showing Netanyahu that he is the one who protects Israel's nuclear ambiguity, and he will do so as long as Israel protects the American interest in seeing Middle East peace be advanced so that he can succeed in his attempt to change the relationship between the United States and the Muslim world, which has so many consequences for the United States, starting with the World Trade Center. So there is, I think, a way of reconceptualizing this strategically so that it gives the president an opportunity to show that he is a strong international leader, which I think does play in the American media as whether a leader is a successful leader and would be a good leader. And if we remember the last election in which Obama ran against a man who ran everything on his ability to be a better leader for America's strategic situation, it is important that Obama be able to cross the threshold of showing Americans that his approach will in fact be a better approach for preventing terrorism and for improving America's relationships with the world that has been hostile to the United States in a very active way over the last decade. Thank you. Let me go to Elise Labbitt of CNN. Thank you. Um, I thought the uh, results of the poll were very interesting, and I think it'll be interesting to see how this administration takes those results as a mandate to, to go ahead and maybe perhaps push Israel a little more. What I'd like to ask you is whether you think that um, Middle East peace and, and concluding a deal with Israeli-Palestinians, is this really something that President Obama sees as 
one of his most important priorities. I know we've talked about Iran and Afghanistan, but you don't kind of get the sense that this is in his DNA uh, as it was with President Clinton, for instance, even though it did take President Clinton many years. And I think maybe we'll see how much fortitude he has over the next year or so to actually conclude a deal. Is this one of his priorities or is this something of his kind of larger um, plan to improve the U.S. image in the Muslim world, the Cairo speech? Um, I mean, where do you judge his fortitude on, on this particular issue? Thank, Thank you. you. Any reactions? Sure. Heather? Um, Elise, I think the interesting comparison, and you're in a pretty good position to make it, actually, if you think back to either George W. Bush at this point in his first term or Bill Clinton at this point in his first term, I think you've seen a, at least as great and probably greater degree. And, you know, to start out with the gambit they started with on settlements is certainly evidence of a high degree of seriousness and commitment to the issue. And they made a public commitment in the Cairo speech that they're going to have to live up to. So and I the selection of three super envoys and yeah. said these are our three priorities, yeah. essentially. Um, any other reaction? Uh, yeah. Well, can I yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, sure. Really, I, I, agree. I agree that that was really kind of impressive coming out of the gate. Right. But do you think that he has the fortitude, is my question, to continue this over the long term. I mean, we've seen a kind of dip in, you know, just gradual over the last few months in trips by Mitchell to the region. I mean, at what point are you not getting anywhere and you say, mm, you let, know, let, I let me focus. respond. I don't know if, it, if, if you have read Richard Wolff's book, Renegade. Um, some folks didn't like Richard Wolff's book because it was so close to the Obama administration that some people criticized it for lacking distance and to some degree objectivity. What I found really interesting is that it, it is a, probably the best distillation of how Obama sees himself. That if he was to write his own book, well, he could write his own book, but uh, uh, have somebody write the own book that would, to delegate that, 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 that he might get this. And I think what's interesting is Obama seems to be only turned on by things that look at that moment of loss or near loss, of coming in to the game as Michael Jordan you know, and, and, and turning things around, shaking up the game. And, and it is an interesting statement that even though it was a defining challenge on the front end, he seems to go through these cycles, and I, we haven't had perhaps enough time to see, where he throws out some folks and says, okay, you go work on it, come back to the UN General Assembly, and he slaps everybody around and said, you're not playing well enough, come back to me. Maybe they fire the envoys. I, you know, watch for early 2010. Um, none of them seem to be doing that well. And, and and then you look at it, and so it's an interesting and different sort of pattern as opposed to a straight line, you know, focus. And so I'm wondering whether failure actually turns this guy into a more active agitator. And I think that's been true in healthcare. I think it's been true in uh, Afghanistan. I think it's been true in um, climate change. I'm not sure it's true with Israel-Palestine yet, but I just uh, want to... Just, just uh, I would, what you said, Steve, a moment ago, that... Uh, relation, uh, something like, not a quote, but something like, relations between the U.S. and the Israeli government are even icier than they have been in decades. Believe me, that, you know, the public liaison people, the Hill liaison people are going to be saying, look, we're not going to be around in the second term if we don't, if we make this worse, not better. I mean, I, I mean now, Obama, for reasons you say, might see it as a, a, a confrontation to take on, but every political advisor he has will be telling him just the opposite. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, this gentleman right here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the uh, good, tight summaries. Um, my name is Tom Getman, and I served for five years in Palestine and seven years in Geneva with evangelical agencies. And I'm sensing a big switch. A lot of evangelicals voted for Obama. There's sojourners, there's evangelicals from Middle East understanding, there's Mark Braverman's new book, Fatal Embrace. And I don't think we've paid enough attention to those 40 million, if it's that many really, that uh, are beginning to merge more with the mainline churches. When, when um, we did the anti-apartheid work, we got the black church and the Catholics to join us in that as we were writing the legislation on the Hill. Do you see any sense in other polling data, because we haven't touched on it today, 
that this is going to be a critical point in giving Obama room to run. Jim? Perfect. For you. I, uh, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I don't, uh, at least not in, in the grassroots. I mean, uh, look, the conservative Christians, if, you know, if that's what you're, you know, well, or just Christians as a, as a block. Well, let me just put it this way. If Mike Huckabee was president, what would he be doing? Well, I mean, uh, um, I mean, Mike, Mike Huckabee's last known position on the Palestine, uh, Palestinian... Did you write it? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, it precedes me. Uh -huh. uh, was the Arab world is big and they could go somewhere else other than Palestine. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, so, and I don't think President Huckabee would make that his final position uh, on the issue. But, I mean, if you just, again, in terms of where the climate is right now with tea parties and Glenn Beck and so on, and you've, you, you see the, the gay marriage referendums and so on. I mean, you just, you, I, I don't see any particular movement among the center-right Christians on much of anything, except further to the right in opposition to Obama. Thank can you. I, can I yeah, add sure. to that? I think the way to think about the development you mentioned, which is a real and important one, is actually not to think of it as a top-down thing, but to think of it as a bottom-up thing. And where, if I were working on that full time, I would want to start seeing that change manifest itself on the Hill. And I think that's where that movement can have a real targeted effect in some targeted places, as much by giving members of Congress, giving them running room, giving them permission to think a little more broadly about these issues than maybe they've felt it safe to do in the past. And I think from there, that change can trickle up rather than trickle down. Sama Adnan and then Matt Duss of the Center for American Progress. Hi, so th that's actually exactly where I was going to ask you because my name is Sama Adnan, I work with, um, actually I founded a new policy pack which is a political action committee for a two-state solution which we think it's, is in America's national interest. What I was gonna say is you guys haven't mentioned the effect of lobbies, uh, especially pro-Israel packs, on electoral politics and what has changed since the Suez crisis in the 50s, along with Ben-Gurion pulling Israel outside of uh, the Sinai. So what do you guys think about that, and how does that factor into President Obama not being supported by the Congress? Thank you. Lobbies, Obama, not supported, supported? Well, I would say that the big news in the last year has been J Street, which I think has changed the equation substantially. Yeah, and I would just add one thing to that, which is, you know, it's interesting you used to say, well, what has changed since Suez? I would say, you know, what has changed since last year and what has changed that we don't know yet has changed? And that, to me, is the key kind of, I, I feel like the most interesting of all the things, all the many global pieces in the, the Middle East equation, the most interesting and the most promising one right now is exactly the room for change that organizations like yours can can be producing, and even where um, people are having difficulty coming up with ideas about how we move the situation on the ground, you know, we know that there's a lot of disaffection and dissatisfaction with the sort of informal lobbying system the way it exists. Nobody can quite see what's going to come in place of of the old world order, and so this is a really you know that is the most fascinating and unknown piece of this whole puzzle, I think. Let me just you know, piggyback one thing before we go to Matt. Um, I, I, I will out myself. I have, a lot, I have friends that I, I talk to at APAC, um, and I, when I talk to them, I sort of look at this poll and I ask the fundamental question. I said, well, how are different parts of the, the environment here going to perceive this, this poll that we released today? And as I looked at it, and I look at, you know, where, where APAC officially is in terms of the president, officially is in terms of, of questions about Israel-Palestine peace process, there, there are nuanced differences, and I, I, and I, I wouldn't speak for them. I, I, I don't suspect that many would have a hard time with where this, this, this poll is and, and the notion of negotiations, but a security-first focus that didn't necessarily uh, represent the most flamboyant or fundamentalist wings on either left or right in terms of the, 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 the view of the president. Do any of you have a reaction about, Stephen, do you have a reaction about, about that aspect of our political lobbies here? You're asking this Stephen or this Stephen? I'm Jim. No, he's Jim. You're Stephen. Oh, okay. I'm Stephen, too. Okay. But, uh, I knew that there was more yeah. than one Stephen. Yeah, I could get down over there. I frequently get accused of being panelist. And, uh, but go ahead. My own feeling is that the 
the Jewish community at this point is as much concerned about Israel's future if there is no peace as they are concerned about maintaining the idea of no sun, no light between the Israeli position and the American position, which used to be their view. There should be no difference at all between the American position and the Israeli position. I don't think that that is the American Jewish view anymore because there is a great concern about what is happening in the future of Israel. There is something that happened this week that is a good example of why that has become such a big issue. This year, this week, the, the Israeli Minister of Justice made a speech in which he said that Israel's law should be based on religious Israeli law, religious Jewish law. And for Israel to start talking about that kind of fundamentalist legal takeover of a democratic society, in this environment, when we are so concerned about what happens when we talk about Arab states giving more power to Islamic law, to Sharia law, it is a shocking thing. I don't believe that that will go much further than it has already by this Minister of Justice, but it has given a chill to many people who follow Israel closely to see that Israel society is being deeply affected internally by the continuation of this problem and they know that they cannot stand the consequences. Matt Duss. Matt? Great blogger, Thank by you. the way. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, going back to Huckabee, I think, you know, we're sitting here chuckling about what he did in, in Israel. But I'm not chuckling. Okay, well, yeah. no, thank you. Um, let's understand, this is a, the, the, the state of this debate in the United States is such that this was a past and probably future presidential candidate, a serious candidate, going to Israel and not only supporting the eviction of Palestinians, opposing a two-state solution, but essentially endorsing population transfer on a grand scale. And it really just passed almost unnoticed in, in, in those terms here in the United States. So. My question is, I mean, President Obama, he was widely recognized for the speech he gave in Cairo, which I was very impressed with. And one of the things I was most impressed with was this is the first time I'd ever heard an American president hold up the right of the Palestinians and the Jews to their own homeland in Israel-Palestine as co-equal. I mean, Palestine is not kind of a second kind of booby prize for, you know, just take this and be quiet. Both of these peoples have a right to their own homeland. And he's been criticized, and I would agree with a lot of this, that he has not done the same kind of outreach to the Israeli public, but I don't think he's really done this or laid this groundwork with the American public to make this argument to Americans. <clears throat> I mean, we are becoming a more diverse country, but we are still by and large culturally, if not religiously, a Christian co country. We are surrounded in many ways that we don't even understand by a Jewish and Christian narrative that just makes us more culturally, it easier to more culturally identify with Israel more so than the Palestinians. So I'm wondering if the panelists think that a more, you know, a, a richer and, and more forthright outreach to the American public in those terms might help here. You know, the Center for American Progress ought to invite the president to give that speech. Uh, anyway, uh, reactions? Um, well, I guess I should go first. Uh, I mean, look, Mike Huckabee has his position, and I guess it should, it, per what I've said earlier, it should tell you something that the, the bulk of the American public doesn't mind what he said. Uh, he'll be blackballed by the Council on Foreign Relations and will still be a popular figure uh, with best-selling books and a highly rated TV show and, and a, great, a, a great political future ahead of him. That should, that should tell everybody that you know, the, the elites and the chattering classes can get themselves into a, a, a frenzy over we got to do something, we got to do something. And as Edmund Burke said about British public opinion during the French Revolution, it just doesn't change very much and doesn't change very fast. Um, and so that's just a cautionary flag to anybody who would be advising President Obama or President anybody else uh, to be a hero on this issue. 
I, I totally disagree with that. It's not, no, I mean, it's not cool. that. <laughs> um, Americans don't care that Huckabee did that because they don't know that he did it. And they don't understand that it has consequences because, and I not because there's anything wrong with the American public, by the way, but because there's nothing about we how we receive news and especially how we receive news about the rest of the world that would explain why any of that matters. And that is totally different from saying they don't care about it because they think it's cool if you send all the Palestinians to go live in Jordan and Syria and <laughs> wherever the heck else it is Huckabee thinks you could send them. So if you actually ask people, they're very comfortable with the two-state solution. As I said, they're very comfortable with the U.S. leading efforts toward a two-state solution, and they're not going to vote against anybody who says, I'm in favor of a two-state solution. Now, would I advise anyone to get up and say, I'm running for Congress, the Senate, the presidency, and make... Um, I'm finally going to do what no one else has done and get a real two-state solution, a sort of fundamental plank of their program? No, that won't get you elected to dog catcher. I mean, it shouldn't get you elected to dog catcher. But so, Matt, to, to go back to the original premise of your question um, and to go back to what Stephen said at the very beginning of this about the things that were going to be needed from the U.S. to make an actual peace agreement happen and stick, to get to those things, especially this, this NATO, the idea of NATO peacekeeping, which, which is a very real issue, that's going to require significant presidential engagement with both Congress and the public in a way that has not been done to now. But part of the reason it hasn't been done up to now is that it frankly hasn't been needed up to now because, as I said, um, the American public's just not the primary problem here. Uh, before I turn the floor of it, uh, at, in, in the words of Walter Russell Mead, my colleague who's much more a Jeffersonian, Wilsonian type, I'm much more of a Hamiltonian uh, tough guy, but I, we, will, we will have more democracy in a moment. Um, I, I'd like to take one last question. If I didn't call on someone, it's because of the lights. That's my excuse. Uh, but, but last question back here, the very back of the room. I think that's you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Mark Open, George Mason University, Great, thank you, CRDC. Um, just a, a question to Steve, actually. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you, uh, to Steve Cohen, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with uh, the, the, the notion that the, the first out of the starting gate negative pressure of the settlements turned out to be a, a disaster as a pressure tactic. And I'm wondering whether if you were with Obama Mitchell right now, what would be the single greatest uh, place of positive pressure that you would have them place right now on, on Netanyahu and the Israeli electorate that you think would be more effective than the strategy that they used? Great, now. great final question. Stephen? I think that it is the issue of the focus on nuclear nonproliferation. And for the president to speak to Netanyahu clearly about the importance of to Israel's strategic future of the United States continuing to defend Israel's nuclear ambiguity and the comparison of the importance of that to Israel's maintaining settlements. I think that that would change the debate from a bi bilateral argument to something that puts Israel and the United States in the international context in which they really live. So I would be in favor of president shifting that focus. I do not think it was a mistake to begin with settlements because the president had to show that he was starting off behaving differently in relationship to this issue than has been the case of previous presidents. And I think that that was a very important thing to do. But it is important for him to recognize that the impact of that decision has now run out as a positive effect. It is now turning negative. And he must have a different way of dealing with the issue to bring about change in the policies of the Prime Minister of Israel and in the likelihood that the Palestinians will choose clearly to reject Hamas and reassert their support for a negotiated peace on the basis of two states. Thank you. Uh, any quick reactions from Heather and Jim as we close? No? Okay. As Amjad comes up, please join me in a round of applause for Heather Holbert, <laughs> Jim Pinkerton, and Stephen Cohen. And again, I want to congratulate my colleagues, uh, Amjad Atala 